some of your time here with us at Sunnyside. Welcome, welcome. Uh, today we'll be talking about cool weather veggies. Um, my name is Holly Shippers. I am the seasonal manager. Thank you, my I am Sarah Christofferson. I am also in seasonal, planting up containers. Um, real quick, I'm going to uh, talk about the the handout. It's kind of a, a good resource. It doesn't have a lot of your nitty gritty detail information, but a lot of kind of basics. Um, talking about you know choosing where to to grow, what containers to grow in, uh, soils, fertilizers, um, some pest management. And but we'll, then we'll briefly be talking. Yeah, about and we'll that, go yeah. through all of that in yeah. bigger detail. Um, but then toward the end, I've got some groupings of of plants, so you can kind of see. Um, which plants are related to each other, which is very helpful when it comes to knowing what pests you might be dealing with, what kind of culture they like, um, and when you're interplanting and trying to mix different kinds of plants, which we will go into further, you'll know which ones are related and be able to pick unrelated plants to, to intermix and go together. So, um, and there's also a little chart about um, which ones are good for, for starting a seed at this point. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, perennials and biennials and all that kind of stuff too. So you can kind of know which ones are going to be your, your planting or producing in one season and replanting next year, what, what things biennials do and perennials that are maybe not going to be a big payoff right at the beginning, but long term are going to be a good crop for you if you've got a permanent location. All right, so we'll start out with uh, cool where veggies. to plant. Well, why don't we start out a little bit about cool veggies themselves. Um, they're going to be plants that benefit from being in a cooler temperature, both in growth and in productivity. Um, that could be annuals, that could be perennials, and that can be biennials. Annuals are going to be uh, veggies that will give you the crop for that season. And that season only, you'd have to replant each season. Perennials will give you continuous throughout year after year after year. And biennial will give you a crop the first season and they'll give you the flowers and the seed for the following season. And then you just keep repeating that with the biennial. Um, where do you want to plant? Do you have a big space in the ground? You just wish you had some veggies growing in there? <laughs> Are you limited on space or your ground just is really bad and you want to do raised bed? or limit on space and do containers. I do mine in containers. And how, how much sun do you have? A lot, a lot of your veggies want to have full sun, which doesn't necessarily mean all day it has to be sun. Full sun is considered six plus hours. There are some plants here and there that really prefer a little bit more, like your artichoke could probably handle more sun than, than just a six hours. Um, and then there are things that, that really can do uh, part sun, especially as the season warms. Um, make sure you have a good water source near the location. I can't know, I can't tell you how much people come in and say, I had this great piece of ground, I put a beautiful garden in it, oh, now I gotta haul a 150 foot hose out to it. Well, make sure you're a little <laughs> bit closer to a water source where, wherever you decide to do it. Well, in general, too, if you have, you know, a lot of property, um, the things that you really want to protect, like your veggies and things that might be tasty to other critters too, keeping up, up closer mm -hmm. to the house and closer to your smells and closer to your pets is going to be a, more of a protection for them. Um, you know, as, as well as usually you have, have a water source around your house. So get them up close where you're going to be tending to them and your those other critters aren't going to be wandering qu quite as close. So if you've decided you're going to put them in the ground, you're going to probably want to amend with either compost or the orange bag soil booster. Compost, and I'm just gonna give you some of the uh, ingredients. They all have many, many different ingredients. Uh, compost has chicken manure, bat guano, worm castings, and alfalfa. The the guano, the manure gives you some NPKs, more N than PK. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are those numbers, uh, or letters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, alfalfa in the compost, that has uh, nitrogen and proteins that will help speed up the breakdown of organic composting. You need to have these to help break them down that will help benefit the plants sooner. Um, soil booster, chicken manure, bat guano, worm castings, seabird feather, that's the one that's going to give you the nitrogen and the proteins to help break down the organic matter. In general, nitrogen is going to give you that, that leafy growth which the, there, there are a few plants that don't like a lot of nitrogen, but um, for the most part with these guys, a lot of them were growing just for the leaves. You know, our, our lettuces and kales and mustards, um, but a lot of other things that we're not necessarily thinking, I'm not, I'm not harvesting the leaves, it's a root I want, I'm just gonna feed the roots. Potatoes, you want a big, healthy, happy top of the plant to be able to feed the roots and then the, the tubers. So even potatoes like to have a decent amount of nitrogen. If you're deciding in a container, Ultimate would be a good product. One, one of the ones you can use. That has a, a bat guano, chicken manure, and worm castings, and also microbes. Okay, what do we want to do now? We want to break down organic matter. Microbes are living things that help break down the organic matter. You can also use Edna's. Edna's has a lot less added to it. It has chicken manure, worm castings, um, and a lot of, I think they use uh, some yucca to help keep in, some, retain some of the moisture, so it retains a little more moisture. That you'll have to probably add a little more extra fun to it for your plants. <coughs> Uh, raised bed, that would be another another one. So if you've got raised beds, and it can work in a container as well, that has chicken manure, worm castings, microbes, you know what that is, right? Helps break down organic matter. And mycorrhizae, now myco is fungi, beneficial fungi, rhizae, beneficial roots. That's going to help support a good strong root system to help bring up all these nutrients that we're giving the soil to feed the plants. And they have a good symbiotic relationship with our plants. A lot of times we don't necessarily think of, of fungal, fungus and fungal <coughs> things as being good. They're, some of them are extremely beneficial and really necessary for a, a good vigorous crop. Um, which we're so talking about the raised bed, it's a combination of the Ednas and the compost um, and I've used it in raised beds, and it's fantastic to grow in. Yeah, it's a really good, I love that extra addition of the micro <coughs> Very important for plants. Um, okay, I also, after I've done prep the soil that's gonna go in, I wanna add some amendments. And some of these are gonna depend on what you're planting. Everything can go with azomite. Azomites trace minerals that helps your plant store uh, their nutri nutrition so that they can feed off of that and then bring up more plants, store it, feed off of that. Um, it also enhances flavors of all things edible. It makes a huge, huge difference. Every time someone comes in after they've brought in a crop, they're like, I cannot believe how things have changed with azomite. You also, and that can be with anything, not everything has to, it's just not just edibles, it could be anything, your rhododendron, your anything that needs to store, every plant needs to be able yeah, to the, store nutrients. The plants need their nutrients mm -hmm. too, so, um, you know, it's not just for our benefit, with pulling up nutrients and storing it in the produce that we're eating, it's and benefiting plant. the plant too, yeah. so the azomite, the calcium, this goes for all plants. You also want to add for all plants, calcium. Now some of the products, some of the fertilizers come with a trace amount of calcium. I always add more. Calcium is very important to all plants. It creates a good, strong plant cell base. Kind of like milk, cheese, dairy products for us, gives us stronger bones. Calcium is going to give them stronger plant cells. Um, Which one is that? That would be the oyster right here with the white oh. and the azomites next door with the orange uh orangey pink volcano uh yes those do come in smaller boxes too if you're just yeah. doing a little bit of container gardening 
Um, it can spread a long ways, but um, you know, if you're gonna, if you have a decent sized garden and you're gonna be using it for other plants, the big boxes are great. They're not all that expensive. Okay, lime is on your end. Lime is something you add to sweeten the ground or soil. Not just the ground, soil, the soil base that you're going to be used. It's alkaline. It's going to make the it make the ground less acidic. Um, being, being in a in a place where we get a decent amount of rain, that flushes a lot of a lot of things out of the soil. So our soils and waters tend to be more on the acidic side. One thing you don't want to use lime on are potatoes. They do not want like lime. Um, another one is a product called Solpol Mag, and that's sulfur, potassium, and magnesium. Uh, the sulfur is to help maintain some of the, the green. The um, phosphorus is to, uh, or the sorry, the potassium is to help promote good strong root growth, and the magnesium is what gives it that green in the chlorophyll. Um, so if you look on the bag, there's no N, there's no P, it's a lot of K. <laughs> so that's something you would want to use. It'll make your plants want to stand up and say, look at me, I'm fabulous. <laughs> um, you can also, um, oh, well, let's talk brassicas, let's talk plants. Brassicas are what we basically call our, our veggies. We just like to clump it down into that. It actually is Latin for cabbage but we like to call a lot of the plants brassicas. Yeah, they're, they're all descendants of that cabbage <laughs> family. Yep. So, and there's a chart on those. We're talking the cauliflower, the broccoli, the mustard. And then there's some mothball things that we, we wouldn't even recognize as a brassica, like nasturtiums. Um, so, that kind of goes, so goes back to your, um, which we haven't really touched on yet. But um, intercropping, so you have things like a nasturtium as a good trap crop for those common pests that like brassicas, luring them away from, from the ones you want to eat on something that can handle it and have a little food bank for our beneficial insects. So keep those things in mind too when you're looking at, at relationships between plants. Um, related <coughs> plants can be very beneficial for us too. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about plants. You want to do that or you want something else added in between? Oh, I, I have a question. Is that yes. all right to ask it now? Absolutely. Uh, so I have several four by eight bed, raised beds. How much of the raised bed would I be putting in there if the I'm raised, adding to an existing soil base? The, the raised bed comes in a two, is it two and a half? Three. three. Did it, they promoted it to three? <laughs> yeah, this three is a one point five. Foot, so this is a small one compared to what a big one would. And how big did you say it was? Your it's a four by eight and about uh, 18 inches tall, 18 inches deep. I mean, they're, they're full now, but I'm, is that oh, one, so you one don't bag have, per, what? You don't have to empty them. If they're full with some, just just add some to give them a boost with your other, other so things. So if, if you go with your, your length and your width and then the depth that you need to fill, yes. multiply those, you'll get your cubic feet of what, what you need to buy. And those bales are three cubic feet. But if you already have existing soil, that's it. J just clean it up and add some as a little boost or you know, right. some soil booster and then the other amendments. Yeah, yeah if, you don't, if you don't have a lot of space to fill, you might go with soil booster. I mean, this stuff can just be soil all by itself in every bag if it didn't have stuff added to it. So you can reuse the dirt every year. I clean yeah, I clean out all the roots that you can, and all the debris, and, and you can use it. I, I mean, at some point, I always, I always, I always like it. If it's a container, no, I do. I do. If it's large, then you're you're good. My containers, by the time this want, season's so over, with it's all roots, so I just. Get rid of what do you want to keep in mind with reusing soil? Is if you've had pest or disease issues with plants in that soil. Um, you want, depending on what it is, you might want to kind of clean out a little bit of that, put put fresh, but also um, moving your crops around and not putting something related that has the same issues in that spot yeah, next okay. the next yeah, season. Right. There's yeah. certain things. Every things. year I rotate. Yeah, that's that's the yeah, best way to do. If you're gardening. always adding mm -hmm. goodies, it's not absolutely yeah. necessary. But if you have issues, you're gonna like if you have issues with your. Um, 
some brassicas you had there, don't put brassicas there yeah. the next season. Yeah. Put, you know, peas or, you know, it depends on what the issue is, you know, of course some of these, many of these share the same that's issues. That's why they, they basically break it down and say, if you had brassicas there, don't plant brassicas, as, brassicas again. Just in case you did have an issue and you weren't aware of it, it's going to quite possibly add the issue to your new crop. So, same with tomatoes, you do the same thing with tomatoes, don't plant them in the same spot. Now, now touching on, on pest issues, um, a good way to have less pest issue is to intercrop and mix, mix all of these unrelated plants together in your plantings. Um, so, you know, doing a whole big bed of broccoli is kind of saying, hey, um, cabbage moths, we're right here, the whole bunch of us come, come lay your eggs and it's going to be easy them, for them to find. They'll land on a plant and kind of test it out with their feet several times before laying any eggs and if each time they're landing on a plant that they like, they're going to say this is an excellent place to, to lay my eggs so my caterpillars have all this food to eat. Um, if you have a brassica and an artichoke and some lettuce and some peas, Maybe some umbellifers um, like uh, cilantro when it goes to seed to, to entice some of those beneficial in insects. You're not going to have as many pest issues because they're going to more ha have to find the plants by chance and just happen to, to find that plant and la land on it several times. So um, I, I like to, to get my cabbages all mixed through my garden. I think they're really big and impressive in, in my flower gardens. Um, you know, I, with the broccolis, I like to, to plant um, carrots around them and then um, you know, get, some, get some peas on trellises in there with some, some lettuce that's gonna be shaded out as they get taller and let the lettuce stay a little cooler longer. So, so really think about mixing your plants um, and using the benefits of maybe one that's going to get bigger as it gets warmer and shade provide some shade for things like the lettuces and the spinach that really want to stay cooler. Another thing you want to do um, that I, I was taught by an old grower 25, 30 years ago um, to start things out with copper to help keep down fungal issues which veggies are very well known to get no matter whether it's cool or warm weather um, you can either get this in concentrate and have a spray bottle and really do a good spritzing or um, already we have it already made uh, to spray with. Can I ask you a question? Um, back to the raised beds. Um, so if you get the raised bed potting mix, would you want to, I wasn't clear about what else you'd want, I certainly want to put the oyster shell in the azomite. azomite, but would you want the soil booster in there too? to? No, Is there maybe the next season after you've grown yeah. some products and yeah. they've used up some of that, that goody, goodness, the goodiness, goodiness <laughs> then mix in your soil booster to replenish yeah. it. Yeah. So out of the bag, that's going to have a lot of good stuff in okay. it. Growing okay. these hungry plants okay. is going to take some out of it. Okay. And at, as it's taking that out, you're going to be replenishing occasionally with fertilizer. Yeah. But definitely do the azomite and the calcium for anything. Okay, are we good to go? Is it plant time? Yeah. Any questions before we start? Okay. Let's talk about some cabbage. This is a red cabbage. It's a very nice solid one and it's just called red cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's great for, you can add it to a slaw. It's got a nice firmness to it. I like to just eat it by itself. You can put it, you can even put it in certain sandwiches. It's great with rye bread. Use your imagination. It's great to use for a lot. Not, it's not a good thing for sauerkraut. We'll, we'll cover that one. What about soups? Is that? That could be used in soup. It'll hold. So um, that's not just, that'll grow cabbage? That Sorry. grows a big cat. Yeah. Well, okay. you know, not not this big, but yeah. you know, red cabbages are a lot smaller. Sorry, so basically, with the uh, cruciferous plants or the brassica family, um, the not cabbage not family, not the crucible, not the crucible. <laughs> um, they all um, 
they've all been messed with by us people <laughs> to, to, to grow into different things. So, so selected for the ones that head, like a cabbage, just like you have lettuce that creates a head and other that's, that's leafy. There's ones like broccoli and cauliflower where they grow big flower buds and that's what we're eating is the flower bud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mustards were, were, kales were eating the leaves and collards and we liked them to grow nice yep. big leaves. So um, we've, we've uh, chosen plants and cultivated plants that, that fit our needs, but they're all coming from the same, the same thing. They're chosen ones. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Savoy Ace cabbage. This is awesome as a slaw. It's a really thick, sturdy, strong cabbage. Great sweet flavor. Savoy generally is that kind of crinkly look. This is a green pres presto cabbage. Again, it can be used uh, in soups. It's not as sturdy. The sturdiest right now that I have is the Savoy. Uh, very nice green cabbage still. <clears throat> broccoli. This is a marathon broccoli, kind of one of your typical standard broccolis. Really good, firm uh, flower head, a nice sweet broccoli flavor. Even better with cheddar. <laughs> so if you think about broccolis, most of these broccolis will grow and give you one big head. But after you that hovers that head, it'll send out little side shoots of like little individual florets. So you can, can keep harvesting from them after you har harvest the big head. There are some that just grow the little florets. Yes, we'll get to this. Uh, this is Waltham, another kind of good sturdy big head, nice and uh, fresh and green and sweet. Great in stir fries. We've, we've roasted them, we stir fried them. When you roast them, you want to make sure you have uh, olive oil, salt, and pepper. Um, I've made broccoli salads that are broccoli and grapes and real good. All kinds of goodies. This is a burgundy broccoli. This is not going to be the traditional big head. These will have smaller heads. Uh, very tasty as well as the, um, the stems. We have here. This is Destiny. Destiny is going to be what you buy in the grocery store basics, typically. Uh, nice, solid, short, big, short uh, flower head. Big, thick stems. You can still eat them. You just have to slice them a little thinner, cook them a little longer. Let's see. This is a fun one. This one's called Graffiti. It's almost um, a purpley, hot pinky color. Always fun when you've got kids. Very flavorful. Antioxidants. Anything that's got the purples is going to be higher in antioxidants. This is a Vita Verde. This is your green one. I always say it looks like it's something under the sea. Really good. Very flavorful. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> well, I thought I had. One of the, a, a Rubini, a, a Rubini is going to be the, um, you know, the long skinny with a small floret, very tender, flavorful, very sweet uh, broccoli. And I just did not bring one is in. Is that like a broccolini? Yeah, ve yeah. very same, same kind of uh, growth, yeah. yes. Let's move on to, oh, here we go. Ha, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. <clears throat> Yeah, talking up about broccoli. <coughs> oh, the cat! I didn't put this in order. The Katarina is a nice cabbage. It grows smaller cabbage heads and then produces small ones at its base. And if you clip those, they can produce more of the smaller ones, not the big ones. Nice tender cabbage. Great for steaming and soups and such. Cauliflower. This one's called cheddar. Yes, it is orange. No, it does not taste like cheddar. <laughs> We've had a lot of people say, oh, does it really taste like cheddar? No, it's just the color you of still cheddar. still need to add your own cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Amazing cauliflower. This is a big white head. Great to roast in the uh, oven as a whole head of cauliflower. Slice, 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 drizzle with olive oil, salt and pepper, and any of your seasonings you, you want. It will absorb anything you put there. I like to do it in my Indian seasonings. It's delicious. Now cauliflower, if you want it to be a nice bright white, 
Um, don't you have to, as it's developing, a lot of people will, will take the leaves and, in the and, old days, and cover them up. In the old days, you had to fold the leaves and put a rubber band so as it grew, it would be there. A lot of what the hybridized ones are now, they just form on their own. So chances are you're getting a more current one since the old days. <laughs> you eventually have to wrap it up like a present. That's, that's why I stopped years and years and years ago. That's why I stopped growing broccoli and cauliflower because of the wrapping. I did not want to have to bother with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, there you go. There you go. So we have a, a purple cauliflower. Again, like anything purple, it's going to have the antioxidants and it's fun to grow. They taste yummy. They're sweet and delicious. Now, not all of these are going to stay purple when you steam them. They can uh, dull up on you. Yes? Question about broccoli and cauliflower keeping the aphids out of them. <laughs> That's <laughs> nature. <laughs> That's nature. Intercropping, so you don't have it all together, or you have other plants mixed in, is going to help. Um, the aphids aren't just going to find it quite as easily. Having other things that aphids like, as trap trap cloths like the nasturtium. Um, we often hear about marigolds repelling everything. Well, they can attract aphids to their flowers. So anything that's attracting them away from your, your food crop is going to be good. And if you then leave them and let them have the aphids like nasturtium, it seems like you can have, flip a leaf and see all sorts of aphids where you didn't even realize because it's the plant's still just going strong. Uh, but then having those aphids there, give, give your birds, your parasitic wasps, uh, like every, your ladybugs, something to attract them and keep them in your garden. You just if you, leave those those on the leaves yeah get rid of them. yeah uh, to an extent it's, mm -hmm. it's up to you i personally want to encourage a whole ecosystem i love the beneficials if you don't have food for them they're not going to come but aphids can take over and they are born pregnant they take over in a blink of an eye so if you don't want to have the aphids we have a for organic gardening solution called ins insecticidal soap um, this is something you don't do just one time. You have to keep checking. You can also hose with a good stream of days. water. Some of them will get back up yeah. on your on your plant, but a lot of them won't, and they're very soft they're body. Very soft body. Yeah. All right. Celery. This one is called Red Red Venture. It's going to be a skinny kind of reddish stalk. It's great for soups and salads. It's not going to be the traditional big thick green one. For that we have, which one did we pick? Utah. So that's going to be your thick green um, celery. And these like a nice moist soil. They don't like to dry out. They don't want to be in a swamp, but they don't like to dry out. Peas. Peas are delicious. This one is a snap pea. This is called sugar ant. This is the one I grow. It never makes it in my house. I snack on it as I'm watering my veggies. In case you don't have this all cemented in your, in your mind, snap peas are the pod that's edible with the formed peas inside. Snow peas are the flat ones. So you're eating the pod and there's not a very developed pea in it. So the snap pea, they're very juicy, very thick and juicy. And Shelling can, peas are the ones you open up and take all the peas out, and it's got a thin shell that you don't eat. The pea tendrils are great in sandwiches or just nibbling on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any specifically tendril peas? This we did not bring any in yet. There are tendril peas that grow like Other wild than tendrils, so so you can add them to your salad, There's your stir fries. Shelling pea out there that's looking like it's a tendril pea. <laughs> Ooh, it's tangled in itself. This one is um, an Oregon sugar pod. That's going to be another sweet snap, which is going to be the juicy, yummy one. This one is, this is a snow pea. This is the flat pea she was talking about. This would be like for your stir fries. It's a little stringier, so it's meant to kind of be really cooked. It's not one you want to just nibble on. It's got a kind of a stringy core to it, but it's awesome in stir fries. I use it all the time. Um, I'm still chewing. <laughs> sweet wave. This is a snow pea. And this one's going to be, it's a mixture of two ones, it's two ones, I contradicted myself. 
It's a it's a combination of two uh, types of peas. It's just a fun mix. Okay. So with all those snow peas, how tall do they get? Um, these are probably going to get about four feet. They can vary. Yeah, it depends on which variety. one. You need to put a Trellis just something that they can climb on. Some people yeah. use netting at an angle. Some and people do trellises. The peas, you know, their their tendrils are little skinny things that once they they find something to wrap on, they wrap around. So they do like something kind of thin to wrap on. So I've done you know, very basic bamboo teepee, tie them <laughs> yeah. together at the top, and then run some some twine through so they have the twine to to scramble up. Um, they do well with a, a tomato cage, you know, just yeah. something <laughs> for so the, the thin, thin but sturdy wires. It's thin enough that they can wrap around and grab onto it. So as as the pea is growing, and that tendril is slowly spinning as it's getting longer until it finally has something to grab. So that's how that that works. This one is a maxigold. This is a shelling pea. Shelling peas are what you're going to want to take the pea out of its husk, out of its shell. And there's usually about nine peas per pea pod. Okay. This is a pock choy or a bok choy. They're the same thing. It just depends on what region of China you're in, on whether it's a bok or a pock. This one is a great pea. <laughs> 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 This one is a dwarf, so it's going to be a smaller pak choy. It's great for, what I, I just had wonton soup and it had some of this, and it wasn't even chopped up. It was just a, 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 a piece, you know, the whole thing in the bowl of soup. Really good. Very delicious. So it's like the baby bok choy that you buy in the store? Yeah, very similar to that, yeah. And then this one is a red one, so it's going to have hints of, of red to it. It's going to be a little bit larger than the dwarf. So pretty. Of course, Very as a designer, pretty. I need to have all my different pretty things. Yeah, so as, I love that one. As, as I'm putting this out, I'm thinking, oh, God, that's a gorgeous color. I didn't talk beets, but that's a gorgeous beet color. <laughs> well, and again, purple antioxidants. So yeah. you've got the same plant, but you've got that added benefit to it. This is a spinach. This one is just called spinach. It's just a standard spinach. <laughs> and then this one is carver. Now, Corvair ha has less stems to it as a lot of the uh, spinaches. You know, sometimes the stems get in the way. I eat them anyway, but I'm not going to waste them. And this is chard. This is a rainbow mix. It's very colorful. Again, we just we think about how to design it into our veggie garden and eat it as well. <laughs> now, the chard's a nice, uh, tough one that <coughs> it can really keep going into warmer weather. Yeah, um, it can go all the way to... I mean, yeah, I, that, that one's a fall. biennial, yeah. so you can um, leave it, you know, it can get a little bit bitter and tough toward the summer, but then it's going to keep going into the fall as we get cooler, it's going to sweeten up again. And then if you let it go through the whole winter, next, next year it's going to bloom and produce seeds. So if you're a seed saver, you're going to be gathering from those next year. Um, and a lot of these other guys, once it gets warm, will bowl to go to seed. And if you want to save the seeds, you wait for it to go through its flower and set its seeds. Yep. If not, get it out. Of get it out and put the plant the next thing. This is a beet. This is a Detroit red beet. Gorgeous foliage. Again, uh, we look at that. Where will you look good next to? Who who will you look with on that day? It's gorgeous. Um, this one's going to be a striped white and red inside, red on the outside. Oh, which one's that? This is the Detroit. Detroit. This Warm one. Beet greens are, are great to throw in your salad mix too. Mm. This one's Chiogio. This one is going to be a a red, a pinkish red. It's not like the deep blood red, pinkish red, but it's also going to be a striped inside. And then this one's going to be a uh, a gold one. This one is called Touchstone Gold. That one's a very popular one. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ones that sells out fast. Very good. Beets are great roasted. Uh, you know, you can stir fry them. And you can see there are a gazillion plants in that one little pack. So yes. you want to and tease them apart. Try to be gentle with those roots. Cause don't, course, don't just do this. The roots are going to grow with our beet. Yeah. You going to talk about some stuff over there, lady? Um, I thought I'd swap with you. 
you gonna swap with me? Oh, you want me talking? Yeah. I'll just be the peanut gallery. <laughs> All right, peanut. All right, let's talk lettuce. This one is just a Paris Island, very sweet, very good green romaine lettuce. I like this one, it's a fun speckled. This is a, oak, a, a camo oak heart mix. It's kind of speckled like, what's that other one? Blood, that tongue one, that deer tongue. There's, there's one that has the name has to do with trout as well. Yeah, oh, that's right. Way. Yeah, there's some fun names for these. I wouldn't want to eat them when they're called trout, but <laughs> oh, they're good. They're, they but they're good. Like trout. <laughs> I didn't bring trout in yet. <laughs> uh, this one is uh, outrageous romaine lettuce. It's kind of a combo of the green and the and the red. It's kind of an in between blush. Very delicious. This is going to be a salad mix. This is gourmet. Yes, it is. So you get different lettuces, different deliciousness in these mixed packs. Question, yeah. please. The, the, you, those are like six plugs in the container? Uh, some are six, some are three, so depending my on where they come from. My question is, uh, how far apart should you space them? In, in, in well, what you garden? want to give them some, a good space, too, to get big. They will get nice and big. It, it depends on the plant. Yeah, too. it all depends lettuces, on what you've got in these. You know, if um, one of our favorite ways to harvest lettuce is to constantly be taking the outside bigger leaves off and leaving the small ones in the middle so to they keep, keep growing, out. Pick rather the than outside, cutting yeah. a whole head, because then it's done. But if you're taking off the the outsides, the inside's going to de develop, and you just keep harvesting like that. Then, as if you're harvesting a lot, you're going to keep your plants quite a bit more narrow, so they can be closer together. If you're doing things like it depends broccoli, on how much you eat each or day. Cat, like your broccoli is going to get big before it develops its its bud, so you want to make sure you're going to be leaving plenty of room, or intercropping with things like lettuces that they can shade it, shade a little bit later on. This is a multi-leaf oak <coughs> leaf um, lettuce. Beautiful color, beautiful flavor. All these are great for salads, sandwiches. Use your imagination. Fusion, Summer Crisp. This is, see, this is a fun ruffly one. There's so many different foliage uh, shapes. This is a nice crispy green, frilly one. This is multi buttergreen. It's like a butter crunch. Not quite as, as crunchy, but it's delicious uh, green lettuce. Mustards. I love mustards. This one's Ruby Streaks. I love it on my sandwiches, on my salads. I eat a lot of sandwiches because I work. I eat a lot of salads because I love salads. Mustards add a, a little, little spice. Little kick. spice. Little spice to it. This one, this one needs water. This one is Mizuma. Mizuna is a really nice, nice one, nice green one. You can see this one is a combo of green and burgundy or purple or darkness. Turnips. Tur oh. Did I grab the turnip? I did. I grabbed the turnip. This is a turnip. Turnips are like a rutabaga, you know, any root, hard root vegetable. They're great in stews. They're great roasted. They're great steamed. It just depends on what you're going to do with them. This one does very well with, with our climate. This is kalarabe. This one is Bees. Bees is a nice, regular side kalarabe. Delicious. Uh, again, steamed, stir fried, roasted soups. This is another one. This one is Delicacy Purple. So this one won't have a white bulb on it like, like Bees, but it will have a purple one. Again, there's the, some more antioxidants. If you haven't grown those, they're, they're, fine. they're fine. You get to watch the it bulb up above the ground. Okay, this is this is a new one. This is a kale. This is called Rainbow Candy Crush. <laughs> I'm trying this one this Are year. you familiar with what we call the ornamental cabbages and kales? The kales in uh, the fall mm -hmm. when we bring them in? They're totally different than what you see in the veggie, veggie version, right? They're not edible, right? They're not. Well, guess what? It took them 10 years to develop one that looks, with all the colors, beautiful like the fall ornamental but it's an edible mm -hmm. 
so this is really this is exci this is exciting for us because yeah. this is new. <laughs> What's that called? This was called Rainbow Candy Crush Kale. So I'm I'm wondering with that. Generally, the kale and the cabbage that we get in the fall, they're a little dull when we first get them in, and then they color up as it gets cool. Do you think these are going to lose color as it warms up? It, it's possible, but again, it's a new, new, it's new, so we don't know if it's warmer. We know, it handles the warmer more, so we're going to play. Uh, Black Magic. This one's really good as like uh, kale chip. You ever dry them and drizzle them and salt them and have kale chips? This is a really good one for that. You can juice it. You can soup with it. That's one of the last sonatos that, um, and people say dinosaur kale. That's what they're referring to, kind of bump, bumpy leaves. This is a sugar loaf uh, radicchio. They're grown like a lettuce. They taste, or they uh, um, look like a lettuce. They taste a little bit different than a lettuce, but they're great in salads, sandwiches. Delicious. I like I like my salads with mixes, so I like a little of everything. This is a Leonardo. This is another uh, radicchio. This one's a dark foliage. Um, onion sets. Onion sets come a couple different ways. This one is can red candy. Now to plant the red candy or any of this type of set, what I do is I stick my finger and I drop it in, I cover it up. I don't worry about it being really deep. I want to have some of its surface as it's growing so I can see how big they are before I pull them. Oh, these sets are a really good deal. Yeah. Um, are they $6.99 this season? Uh, $6.99 and $50 to $70 per bundle. Yeah. Uh, uh, always individual? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be at least 50 onions. If you don't have room for 50 onions, share with a friend. <laughs> this is another way of doing sets. Already dried out, ready to go in the ground. Baby bulbs ready to ready. get some roots on them yep. and grow some more for you. Garlic. This one is called California. Now garlic, you would take every one of these apart and, have, and plant each clove individually and again i used the finger <laughs> method to doing that we're real scientific in our uh, gardening <laughs> um now, for garlic you need to go through the winter you cannot harvest the same yeah. when you plant this now it's going to grow one nice big bulb and it's going to gather energy yeah. but then it, as it goes through the winter and the cold it splits into those individual cloves so then next spring it's going to be growing those that bulb with all the individual cloves you know and then you'll be able to, to harvest it and have a nice, nice beefy. Um, the California being the most common that you find in the grocery stores. We don't have a lot of varieties here in the spring. We do get some good varieties in in the fall that you can plant in the fall and have go through the winter and then um, harvest next spring, summer. Now this one is elephant, yes. So what I'm hearing you say is if you want to grow garlic this year and next year, you need to plant enough to harvest for this year, but then leave some so that they. If you want some this year, bigger. you need to plant last year. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it has to go through a winter, or you're just going to get like kind of that one little piece is just going to be a little bigger. Okay. So, so I, I mean, you can still eat it. I but. plant my garlic in the fall, so will it, it will somewhere in the this next fall it will be ready sooner. It'll sooner. be sooner yeah, than you fall. planted last fall. Yeah. So it's gone through a winter, but it still needs a little time to, to keep growing. So you're going to watch for those those bottom leaves to start browning and dying off. Each each set of leaves um, is related to uh, a, that paper covering. So after you get a couple sets of leaves browning, that means that the paper covering is getting papery and going to protect it. So. If you pull it before those are browning, you gotta use it right away. But once you get a couple of sets of leaves browning and it's developing the paper to protect it, then you can harvest it and, and cure it, um, letting it sit out in the shade to, to dry and cure and have all the rest of the greens die off. Before and if it's still go, it. if it's still needing to continue growing, and for whatever reason, because they will do this just out of the blue, they set a spade. 
that to the flower bud, get rid of that, or it'll stop producing the 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 corn and just want to look pretty. Yeah, that's a soft neck. Those are very good for stir fry. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people let them um, start growing and then cut them all off and stir fry them and then oh. let the part in the ground keep developing. Every spring I see them for a short period of time in the produce section at the grocery store. Uh, this one is elephant. Now elephant's going to be a much bigger garlic. Uh, it is uh, part of the genius, gen genius, <laughs> genus allium, but it's actually related to a leek in the leek family. So they do that same separating through the cloves, but they're a lot milder. Question mm -hmm. might be a silly one, but couldn't you just use one from the grocery store yeah. to plant? It depends. Some people have, it depends. Sometimes they dust them where they can't do that. It's just a one-time thing, so it just depends. But if it's organic, I mean, when you say dust, dust with what? Um, there's a sulfur. A that growth they inhibitor? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So even there's organic would have that on it? Dust with them. Yes. Um, not necessarily a okay, growth no. inhibitor, but a sulfur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and, and you don't know, you don't yeah. know. You yeah. can yeah. try. Yeah. Now, if if you grow with ones that you know are going to grow, then you can you know save some of those for your next planting. Sure. You'll you'll want to look into how to store them to keep them that long. Um, you know, usually I think it's uh, 40 to 50 degrees and kind of a cool, humid but not too humid. All, you can find all that information online. It's a, little, it's a little specific, but you know, most of us don't have root cellars anymore, but we can make it happen. <laughs> if they're not a certified seed garlic, though, you might be bringing in diseases. You know, like if you're using one from the grocery store, you don't know what it might be bringing in, even if it's organic. You know, so buying one, it's, it's safer to buy one that's already certified. Yeah, and come fall, I, I encourage you to come looking for garlic in the fall, because we can usually get a lot more varieties at that yeah. point yeah. that have a a um, bigger range of flavors and uses. We only have two varieties right now, which is what I can yeah, see. Yeah. I have a question. So since this is cold, you know, crops, I'm assuming we can put them in the ground now? Yes. Yes. And um, what is their lifespan since they're cool weather crops? Where that, do they peak? That can vary on temperature, on whether they're getting the nutrients they need, proper watering. The kind of plant? Yeah. It, it, that can all vary. Each plant but do they or typically on average fizzle out when it's hot, like in August. That's oh, it. they'll definitely start it, to. It really like yeah. spinach is going to yeah. be done long yeah. before August. Yeah. yeah, so it just depends. It on really what it wants is. to be cool. Lettuce wants to stay cool. You can see, prolong it a little bit with with shading them out as it gets warmer. Broccoli's just going to want to bloom. So that's it's not going to finish. That answers my question. Yeah. For three years, I tried to grow broccoli and cauliflower, and I think I was growing it at different yeah. too hot. Don't, for, don't forget, you're eating the flower. You're, so it's going to want to keep forming. Mm -hmm. So the cooler it is, the longer it will grow that bud yeah. before it wants to flower. Okay. So basically at this point, for a lot of the brassicas and things like that, especially cauliflower broccoli, if you try to start from seed now, you're probably not going to get a decent head. It's going to be too warm. So you want to start with starts of, of that, which is actually a great segue into the little blip I was going to talk about with um, there is a little chart in there of things that are easy to grow from seed and, and things that you could start now and, and get a harvest. Um, I did jot down a few little um, a few little notes. I was looking at some of the, looking at some of those things and, and their uh, optimal germination. So when they break out of that seed shell, um, the optimal temperatures. And a lot of them are between 75 and 85, soil temperature. Our soil temperature right now is hovering right around 40. So yeah. this is where you get into, do you want to start it inside, inside um, but then try to get them you know, out during the day so they're not stretching and they're staying acclimated until our, our nighttime temps are and our soil temps are warmer. Um, I did grab, a, a soil thermometer if you want to keep track, uh, they, it will, especially at the surface level, fluctuate quite a bit. It's going to be rising here as the sun's out, but then we're going to get into some cooler, rainier weather again, and it's probably going to dip some. 
probably won't get as low as, as where we started, but it's going to dip some. So um, I also went on the Google <laughs> and found a soil temperature app. It's just soil temperature dot app. And um, you put in your zip code and it tells you right now what the soil temperature, average soil temperature for the area is. And also like a couple days back and, and forecasting a couple days forward. So that, that can help you figure out what's going on right now. Do keep in mind though that, you know, because we're 40 right now, doesn't mean we're going to stay at 40. We might dip a little. Yeah, we're going to warm up and then dip a little. Um, so you're kind of looking for those averages to stay warm enough so the seed's not just sitting and rotting. Yeah. A lot of seeds will do fine and stay in the ground until it's the right temperature for them to, to germinate. Um, some won't. But um, a lot of a lot of these on here um, want to be between 45 and 55 to start germination. So you can seed them at that temperature and get some popping up. If you if you wait until it's a little warmer or you're starting inside, they're going to pop up like a whole up. You're going to get a better rate of germination. Um, but again, that's where that trick is. We want to grow them in the cold. So some, a lot of these things, either starting from a start or starting your seeds inside and then, then taking them outside to, to grow on in the colder weather is beneficial. The one that we do not recommend getting starts, uh, we don't bring them in. Some places do, but carrots, radishes, um, radishes they, uh, don't want to get a pack and, and tease them apart because you're going to damage those those roots and then you're not going to have the vegetable. Um, so carrots, uh, they like to have their soil temperature be um, over 60. So we're going to wait a little bit before we're seeding carrots. Mm -hmm. But then they like to be sur surface so pressed into the surface and then stay moist until they're germinating. So the trick that I found online and it's worked great for me is to get my seed in there, pat it in, water it and put a board over the top and that's going to keep this in contact with the soil it's going to keep it moist and you're checking it once they start germinating you take your board off and i have had great luck with that again they want to be have their soil be 60 before they're before they're germinating so you might be waiting a little bit maybe a month or so or get get a thermometer and you can be checking you can even use your your food thermometers to stick it in the ground uh, to check different different parts of your garden <laughs> I know, I know you don't cook. Your, your food <laughs> came out of the ground. You don't cook. I don't cook. <laughs> you had a chef for a few hours. I days. steal his thermometer. <laughs> she did mention that um, about uh, sensitive roots. Peas are one of those. So this four inch pot has multiple in it, but that's treated as one plant. You do not want to break those apart. So that is where if you want more than one, get one that's a jumbo or a cell pack. That way, each cell is going to be your your plant. And a lot of us grew grew up being told to rough up those roots before you put it in the ground. Not peas. Don't do that with peas. Don't do that with your sweet peas. We we started putting uh, labels on some things out there that are sensitive to root disturbance. So you know, don't rough up those roots. Just put it in as it is, as gently as you can, and let it do its thing. So we're going to quickly show you how to plant asparagus. We get asked constantly on how to plant asparagus. Um, so this is just a demo. We're not leaving it in this. We're not, you know, it's Asparagus just to show is best you. planted in the ground. So I have not, you, this morning she <laughs> said, well, you planted asparagus, haven't you? I'm like, no, I keep renting. I haven't had I forget ground how you are. <laughs> that I can, I can know that I'm going to have this, this property for years and see it to fruition. Um, but it's one of those long-term, you're going to have great crops of asparagus down the road when you plant now. So we're going to pretend we're planting. We're going to put azomite. Remember what azomite's for. All the good minerals, nutrients, drawing up nutrients, storing, getting more nutrition into your vegetables that you're eating. And we're also going to for sure add with anything. Strong The calcium, bones. the oyster shell. Now, asparagus like an alkaline or a sweet ground. So we're also going to add, keep it in mind, this is gonna, we're pretending this is the ground. Uh, we're gonna go by the measurements on the line, which is the purple bag there. We're gonna mix that in. You can't 
pan over lime. I don't st can't stress this enough. You will have a failed crop if you don't pay attention to your measurements. You can absolutely over lime. And you do not want to put lime in the same spot year after year. No. Well, you don't want to put lime down year after year. You put lime down and it lasts you about three years. Then you do it again. Very important. That so the question is, is it too late to lime? It's not too late. It's not going to be changing the pH, the the pH? pH today. It's um, like me. It's going to be the most beneficial for next year as it's breaking down and, and raising the pH of your soil. But it's not, certainly not too late. So for asparagus, you want to dig a trench about a foot deep, as long as you want, depending on how much you want in asparagus, and about a, a about 10 inches foot in rows of, apart. You want to take your asparagus, spread them out, drop them in there. So she's got the, the thick roots and she's got a little crown on top. And then you want them about about that far apart. It's a little deceiving when you, um, if you're buying them already in pots, you're right at the top of that, that pot. That's not how you want to plant it. We also have the, the purple ones in bare root. So those ones you don't have to un, unpot, or I mean, I guess you don't have to unpot them. You just want to get the whole thing down deep. In the bare root, like I'm doing, or in the, pot? the, potted, ones. the potted ones? The potted ones, I would kind of, the soil's really heavy. I would kind of, not take it all away, but loosen some away from it so that I can get some nice, fresh, new stuff. Um, you want to then add two to three inches. Tell me when I'm there. Did we get, did we so get a few inches three? over it? Yeah, yeah very good. So you can see there's still more trench. So as this, these asparagus grow, say it's getting this tall. I'm seeing it get come up, I want to cover that. Now it's getting this tall, I want to cover that. Is this one stalk? One stalk. How long? Well, as many of that come up, oh, I mean, okay. you're not going to get a whole lot. Until up. you get to your soil level. Yeah. So you're not. So as you see, as you, if this is our, our garden soil level, and we planted it down 10 inches, 6, 10 inches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the foot would be ideal, but this wasn't that deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've covered, I've covered, I've covered. I still have some pile, so you're not at your so soil level yet. So wait until that, that pile levels out and you've got a flat ground. And then that's your soil level when it's all flat. And then just let your asparagus grow. You don't want to harvest everything. You don't want to harvest the first year at all. Yeah. They need to really generate a lot of energy in that root system and really become strong before they make you happy and give you a harvest. So leave them alone the first year. Now if you get, get lucky and you have some come up the second year, don't harvest yeah. them all. You need to uh, leave some on each crown. One on each crown. If you think about your asparagus spear, you've got your stalk, that's your stem, and then you've got that little pointy part at the top that's a little different. That's going to grow up and, and be its leaves. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's going to feed its roots and its crown to be able to grow and produce more for you. So you need to have give it a way to produce its own food. Yeah. It needs to grow up and have some leaves. And then you have happy plants. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to make sure you have enough space because they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, they do benefit from this this good soil with a lot of goodies in it. Um, when I was when I was a wee bit younger in my twenties, um, I lived right next to um, what had been an asparagus field, um, and at that time and had been for a while. We had I worked at a radio station. There were radio towers there. It got nothing but occasionally mowed a couple times a season. Um, th and this is in the Wenatchee area, so not a lot of rain you know, through the summer or anything. Every year we'd go out and har harvest the most delicious asparagus. And it was absolutely thriving on ne neglect. Probably would be bigger plants and produce more if it had more nutrition, but they were surviving out there with nobody tending to them. So they're pretty tough plants.
I like to roast them in a 420 oven with a little bit of uh, olive oil and salt and pepper. You can do any seasoning of your choice. And it, the, the, the time depends on how big around they are. I do maybe tw uh, eight minutes. Do you have a question? I did. I read that you need to cut right at the third level. Yes, when you harvest. Okay. Yeah. But again, remember you're keeping some on each ground. Well, and then when they harvest commercially, they have kind of an exit. They go down a little bit below the surface level, but you don't want to be cutting into your crown. So yeah. if you know where your crown is, I just you go can right cut it. at the soil level. Right yeah. Just a quick question on fennel. I've grown fennel before. Do you have any um, additional uh, care on them? Just let them Keep grow. Keep an eye on aphids. Okay. We have found <laughs> through fertilizing and then through not fertilizing that if you fertilize a lot and it's got a lot of nitrogen. They love, oh, the aphids love it. Oh, then they are, oh my god, they weren't okay. there when I blinked. <laughs> so for fennel, yeah. we have found that lower nitrogen really helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's that's one of those things when um, you asked earlier about keeping aphids off your brassicas and stuff. If you've got a strong, healthy plant, um, they're less likely to get taken over by, by pests. They really like kind of a stressed, weak plant. Okay. Um, but only if you're interlocking and there's other ways of Interplanting, so. yeah. Um, so having things like the calcium and all of that is really gonna gonna help too. Having good healthy soil, having the the mycorrhizae, all the things that are gonna help benefit the plant is gonna go Again, for a strong plant important. that can handle little pest issues and aren't as enticing to some of the those pests. Question: Your lettuce. I love lettuce. I grow it. But the sample. You really put that many that close together? Really? Lettuce don't mind that. I used to do lettuce in 20 gallon bins and I would have, I mean, I would have them, their, their plugs this close together. So it'd just be one solid bowl oh, of lettuce and then I just I put them as needed, yeah. Well, it depends on too how, how much you're, you're harvesting too. If you go a long time between harvesting and they're really crowding each other, <laughs> they, they might not be quite as happy, but. I love lettuce. I, I love lettuce. I love, pack them in. I love all this. And there's, there's no reason you can't experiment. If you're like, yeah. if you pack them in, you're like, oh, maybe they didn't like that so much. Spread them on a little bit more next year. Yep. Yeah. I never would have it. Yeah. But <coughs> the, the information on on seed packets or online that you find for growing is generally meant for growing with in a field with machinery. Yep. So they're going to be telling you that your rows have to be this far apart, and that's for for like planting and harvesting and everything with machinery. So generally, these things are going to be planted more closely together. To hit on carrots again, you know, say you have to like space them out. I don't. I just sprinkle seed, mm -hmm. and then if I get thick parts, I'll go there in there and harvest some baby carrots, nice and sweet, snack on them, and it makes a little bit of room for the next ones to develop, and just keep taking the bigger ones out and letting the smaller ones develop. So you can get a lot of production it's, out of a small, small space if yeah, you're going it, about it that utilize way. Utilize your space. That's so important. Yeah, especially if it's small space. So when you're looking at um, nasturtiums and marigolds to help keep away the aphids, how how many of those and where would you would you do it around the circumference or intermixing? It a little bit depends on on your setup. Um, if you have kind of a, a big garden space um, where everything's going to be coming coming in from just certain, you know, just the perimeter. You can plant the perimeter. If you have a raised bed here and a raised bed here, I'd get a couple different things on each raised bed. We call them our sac sacrificial plants. They are out to sacrifice themselves for the good of the inside. So we've got a big square raised bed. So would you put them on each corner and maybe a couple in the middle? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and one of the plants that I really like as a go-to is cilantro. Um, cilantro oh. tends to, you know, grow some leaves, we're harvesting the leaves, and then it'll go to flower fairly quickly, especially when it's warm. Um, it's actually a cool season plant. There's a short window where it's the happiest. Um, but those flowers attract so many beneficial insects. I see hoverflies, I see parasitic wasps, like all of them just love these things. They're, they're coming into my garden, so if they find, um, pest insects that they, they also want to, to munch on or, or use to raise their young or anything, 
they're going to be in your garden to do that. Just keep in mind if you're choosing to use cilantro during a warm weather crop, don't grow it for the cilantro. Grow it for the uh, the, uh, the flower and the seed, which is coriander. Coriander. It was in my head, just not which in my mouth. you can mouth. then use as coriander, or you can keep some of that seed for your next planting. And coriander fresh is delicious. It's got mm. such a flowered aroma to the flavor. Oh, it's delicious. Mm. So I like to do a little pinch, four, five, six seeds in a spot, a couple spots every every couple weeks to, to keep having leaves coming up that I can harvest, but then also have some in flower that are going to be beneficial that way. And they're sweet little um, um, umbrella clusters of flower, white flowers. They, they, they're they not real big, they're not imposing, so they can be in amongst all this stuff happily. Yeah. Did you have a question? Well, okay, so most of this is cool weather, right? Yes, yeah, so we'll have a warm we weather later on. Can we do it now? Absolutely. Well, except carrots. Carrots wait you, a little bit. Wait. And remember they... Probably April. <clears throat> Would be a good time and, for and carrots. And another thing, um, Steve said some about a special neem oil yep, in one of his uh, articles. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the one that says neem. And, and is it different? Is there something special? <laughs> neem is from the neem oil tree, and it has a product or a, a part of it called azadiractin, and that's going to cover the critter that you're spraying, and it's going to suffocate it. So that, that that's what what that does to whatever you spray. Is there a new kind now that's more special? Well, there's other neem products with other stuff in it. There's oh. also neem is, neem is good the, ways of processing it. Oh, yeah. All right. But it's, okay. it's all the same neem yeah. oil. If it has neem in that with other things, that's still right. considered a neem It's also product. good for knocking back fungal issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, like if you're spraying, if you're spraying for maybe some insects, um, but it's also a plant that tends to get, say, powdery mildew. It doesn't hurt to spray the whole thing um, to help keep it from developing powdery mildew. Get those, keep those spores from really latching on and, 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 and growing. And again, this is what this can be used for, the copper. Mm -hmm. Copper is Do specifically fungal spray. and it's, it's very effective. Yeah, I mean, even, I always hit the things that are more susceptible. <laughs> Even if they're not susceptible to a lot of stuff, I still do it. I don't want to mess with it. Now, it's not 100% guaranteed, but it really reduces the chance. I have found that, that kale, tends, some of the kales like to get powdery mildew, so that's a, a good, one, good one to spray and keep that from happening. We're a little bit early, but when we get to talking about um, squashes, zucchini, um, pumpkins, all those things, powdery mildew loves to get on those leaves, so doing some some preventative care certainly doesn't help. If you get thick powdery mildew on your leaves, they can't photosynthesize and make food for the plant anymore. And they can spread and, and cause other issues, whether in your veggie garden or in your plant. Your, yeah. your if you water leaves, it's not going to make it go away, but regular treatments are going to knock it back so it's not spreading so fast and it's not putting out spores to spread. So if you've had powdery mildew last year, what do you do to the soil? Does it carry over? It, it's gone through the winter, you're fine. Just keep an eye out. It can be on the surface, and a lot of times it's, it's surface, it's watering and the splashing, especially yeah. on the leaves. If you mulch, you're going to eliminate a lot of that. Same with watering. Don't overhead water. Yeah. That's a big cause. Overhead watering, overwatering the soil, that's a big cause. So watch how you're watering. I have a question on. Um, yeah. rotating your crops. So if I planted tomatoes okay. here last year, okay. Okay. Plant them somewhere okay. else. Right, but how far? Like if I... You just don't want them in the same root system. Oh. And the root system being 12... Of the average big your plant was. Okay. Or if it's a container, the size of the container. Okay. My my tomatoes are in 20-gallon uh, containers. Yeah. By the time they're ready to harvest, there's no soil. The roots are right there. It's just nothing but roots. Um, so if I had, um, I've got four by eight, four feet wide, I had my tomato plants on one side and peppers or something on the other side. I couldn't put the tomatoes on the other side of four feet because potentially their roots would have gone that well, far. No, they it's, it's also not as big a deal with home gardeners as it is in big commercial setups where they have a big swath of one plant. Okay. Um, if you're planting a lot of different things um, and maybe your tomatoes don't have huge issues, then 
mainly you're going to want to replenish the nutrients and the minerals that they use a lot of. Yeah. But the reason that you want to switch, even if you don't think your plants had an issue, is they might have that you didn't notice. So you don't want that to carry through to another year. Yeah. If you have that possibility. Give, give it time. Some for of that us have small growing areas, yeah. and yeah, yeah. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. I do a lot of. If I'm planting something in the same area, I definitely am mulching. I am definitely adding the stuff it wants back it's in. It's always good to mulch anyway. It helps retain some of the moisture. You know, watering is often. It helps keep some weeds yeah. down. And I I love mulching just with the planting compost. It's it adding great. organic matter. All that stuff, you know, the goodies are getting watered in. The the worms, the beetles, oh, and yeah. everybody are coming and working Very in. Very beneficial. Uh, but it's it's covering up things like fungus issues and and weeds that have blown in and are on the surface. It's going to help cover those and you're going to have less of that stuff popping up. And if you want to uh, add some mycorrhizae and other nutrients to existing, already existing trees, shrubs, plants, whatever, use the um, the, uh, the raised bed or you know any, anything with the microbes and the mycorrhizae. The raised bed would have the mycorrhizae. That's going to really get down into help those root systems. And even well. the, the EV stone fertilizers. Yeah. There's so have, many things you can use that have what you need. If you them. have good soil with lots of organic matter and, and humus, and then may, maybe you'll just want to be adding the fertil fertilizers, the EV stone fertilizers, which is all organic. It's going to be slowly breaking down and, and feeding your plants for you know two, three months. Um, and then it's also adding in those good mycorrhizers to get a good crop going. Just remember if you're using existing ground last year's soil, you still need to add nutrients. You can use all the nutrients up from your previous stuff. What's your opinion on Zudu? It's great. It's, you know, every product has manure. Yeah. It's great. Now most of our manures are aged manures. Yeah. Like, uh, some of those is aged from it depends. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it depends. You'd, you'd want to look into the zoo yeah. and see if it's aged or not, or if you have, need to compost it. They have their first of the year, year mountain, the you know quarter of the year mountain, and so the, it does age if they start at the first of the year. Yeah, I've got chickens. Chicken poop is very hot, very high in nitrogen. But it's good. I throw it in my compost with you know with some of the other browns. They have straw. It all breaks down and mix this together and then it's an amazing fertilizer, but I throw it in my compost to be part of the compost first. Yep. Do you recommend on a raised bed, I always cover it every year, I was told to do that. Is that a good thing to do? It's, a, it's something you can do. What um, are you covering with? Are you just like a this Are you overwintering something? Or Pardon? Are you overwintering something? Or are you trying to no. keep weeds down? No, I'm just trying to, I don't know. That's not, it, That would be to overwinter or to keep weeds down basically. Okay. Yeah. Use a cover crop, that's what I do. It, yeah. It just it depends. If you it's, want to get into cover crops, that's a great way to do it. That's great if you're doing a big space in the ground and so bother if you're doing containers. Well, <laughs> if, if you have a decent sized raised bed, it could be worth it. Oh, yeah. But I, I you know, you'd want to look into, say, you know, winter cover crops. Maybe see what, you know, if you're wanting to add nitrogen, maybe that's a leg. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, do a little research there and find out. And then, um, some cover crops can become a pest issue if you let them go to flower and seed and then you've got them everywhere. So you want to do a little looking into that. But having roots in your soil is so much better than putting some sort of plastic or something over it. You might end up, if once the sun comes out, doing more sterilizing than you are and you don't benefiting. Want, you don't want to st sterilize the good stuff. You don't want to get rid of the bad we don't want because dead you're going to get rid of the good too. Okay. Um, so let, let's come on up here when we're done and ask the rest of the questions. We're getting past our time. So let me end with 20% uh, off will be veggies, EB stone tomato fertilizer, and down to earth products, which are the azomite and the calcium. And then soil booster, which is the orange, will be 30% off. Thank you everybody for coming. If you have more Thank questions, you. come on up.